Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Hey folks, we just wanted to give a shout out and, and a thank you for uh, watching the episodes and subscribing and then uh, also remind you of the benefits of hitting that subscription or subscribe button down below. Uh, Tim, the, the benefits of that subscribe button? I mean, it really helps us a lot. Uh, it allows us to present our case to our, to our sponsors and with that we give basically everything we get from our sponsors we give back to you as as audience so um, it helps us offset our expenses from a uh, equipment perspective I mean to speak of I would say hey we make no money on this this is it's really about trying to provide a good quality product to you as listeners yeah so if you if you don't mind hit that subscribe button you're gonna get notifications of new episodes and other benefits from that so again we want to leave you with a big thank you for uh, watching and supporting the uh, Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbass Show. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses, Tim. Good to, good to have you back. I should say guest appearance by Tim. Tim, the second dumbass. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I know you've been busy. I know uh, you guys have gotten a couple couple episodes out in my absence, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what those turn out, uh, how those are going to turn out. Uh, yeah, I just got back from Texas, and uh, I was anxious. You told me that uh, you guys had this all set up, so I'm super anxious to see how this goes. Yeah, so let's get right into the episode here. So we've got a, you know, an episode here and the focus is going to be on honey, honey habitat, bees, um, all the things that go with, uh, with having bees and, and what bees provide for us. And we've got a special guest, Andy. Andy, you want to introduce yourself? And Sure, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, my name is Andy Joseph. I work for the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Uh, I am the state apiarist. I've uh, been in the position since uh, 08, and um, I enjoy what I do. I work with beekeepers all over the state. Uh, the concern is bee health. You know, bee health, uh, it, it's always an issue. You know, it's the, the position's existed for, you know, uh, well over 100 years, and it's, uh, its focus has changed through the years. Once upon a time, it was bacterial diseases, American fowl brood, things like this. These are things that affect bees and can just crash your colonies, even destroy the equipment that they're in render it useless for any more bees uh and now our biggest issue is a parasitic uh, mite called varroa mites so you know the the pests and parasites have changed but just like so many other things there's always something that's just you know that we're dealing with we got our hands full and there's always more stuff on the horizon so we just look at general health make sure things are clean if they're being sold from one beekeeper to another or if they're moving across state lines which is a big thing for beekeepers all over the country is to move bees around for pollination purposes Excellent. How does one become the state bee expert? <laughs> not I, intentionally. Say, to yeah. be or not to be, right? <laughs> yeah, I could have went that right. route, but I <laughs> yeah. didn't. But uh... Uh, some things work by accident, I guess. I started uh, in bees. I grew up in the country in Ohio, but I have no real memory of people keeping bees out there uh, as a child. I don't remember seeing beehives i don't remember knowing beekeepers surely they were out there but my first real experience with it i was working for a swimming pool company when i was about 17 putting swimming pools in one summer and we put in a pool for this guy he was a hobby beekeeper not too much different from yours they were just all real nice equipment on hive stands and i was just down sweating in this hole you know with a shovel and uh and watching those bees fly and i just thought man that's really neat you know i was in 4-h and things like that when i was younger with different stuff but um and scouts and all that you know i was outdoors always camping and i just thought someday i'm going to try that and so a few years later after school i'd moved down to kentucky by then and uh, started keeping some bees down there just as a hobby and you know start with two hives like almost everybody does and then just by luck had success 
split those out, got more hives, got more hives, eventually went back to school for entomology. Uh, I was looking at maybe into forestry at that point in time and uh, just kind of shifted directions. There were a lot of cuts to the forest uh, industry around that time. And so I took off with the bees right then and, and just kind of changed direction and never looked back. Um, and what, what school, I always been what great. What school was that? University of Kentucky. Okay. Down there. And then there was time. actually a, a, a course on bees. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> this already feels like a long time ago, but I, I have a master's degree in entomology and my focus, all my research there was on, uh, bumblebees really in greenhouse tomato, uh, sort of systems there where they are looking to drive a pollination of those tomato plants by these bumblebee colonies that are moved in just for that purpose and there's a whole i mean this is a huge commercial industry that's invisible to the rest of the public of course uh so i was looking at efficiency of pollination and things but you know that whole time i was managing a bunch of honeybees i had my own i was working with the university's hives so kind of a whole pollinator ecology sort of thing is what i was working on there as a student and uh the job you know here in iowa i don't know if i'd ever really been to iowa except driving across it on i-80 uh it opened up about that same time and this professor, again, I don't know that this is interesting, but a, a professor who I really, really, uh, you know, looked up to, he said, apply for that job, don't get it and learn how to, you know, go through the process and, and get smashed. And, and uh, <laughs> they hired me. <laughs> so that was it. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, they must have been desperate or whatever, you know, but uh, never look back, man. Iowa has been great to us, you know, started my family here. Um, I enjoy what I get to do with beekeepers, uh, you know, work in regulatory government, but I think a lot of our bee laws are fairly commonsensical. You know, it, it, it makes sense to me. Most of the stuff we do, it is regulatory. Beekeepers are usually in line with that. You know, they want to be aware of pests and diseases and things. They don't want to be selling other beekeepers stuff that's obviously infected or infested other beekeepers on the, you know, on the more steep side of the learning curve. They don't want to get that equipment. So it works out good. Yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah. Do you, do you have bees now? I do. Yeah. So in addition to the work with the state, I, my family and I run about 240 something hives of bees. So, uh, we, we do a little almond pollination. You know, I was talking about beekeepers that take bees out of state. We're, we're on that as well. We go out to California every winter. We've done that for about six years. Um, pollinate almonds, cherries, blueberries, you know, whatever we can get into out there. And here in Iowa, we make, uh, we make honey and they're doing pretty good this year. It's been kind of a strange year, but you know, uh, you know, hopefully those couple hundred hives will produce a decent crop for us. And we sell it all the local markets and things around town. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to have you repeat this at least a couple times here, but, um, if people wanted to get a hold of you, um, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. Well, I'm, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm here kind of as a state employee, so I'll give you out my, my contact number. And of course I can give you my personal number too. If anybody just wants to talk bees, I'm up for it. But, uh, again, my title with the department of ag is state apiarist. Uh, my phone number there is uh, 515-326-5765. Uh, my work email is, uh, andrew.joseph j-o-s-e-p-h just like typical spelling so andrew.joseph at iowaagriculture.gov yeah and we'll put that you know we'll put that right here on the video um both the number and the email address that uh, people can get a hold of you appreciate so. it yeah yeah don't hesitate all right um so great andy it's great to have you here and um you know so let's start with this you know our theme of our podcast is mostly outdoors and land ownership and habitat building and all the things that go with it so let's kind of use that as our foundation of questioning today and uh, so if i'm a landowner you know if it's four acres two acres 60 acres two thousand acres i wanted to get into bees you know where would i start what would be the steps and what would you recommend Sure, that's a great question. You know, it's it's easier to get your hands on bees now than what it really ever has been historically, and and that's kind of a bad thing, because every spring we get beekeepers that just go down to their fleet farm, buy a hive that's already put together and painted, get their hands on some bees, which you can go over to Perry, you know, get a package of bees from Spring Valley. It's a great way to start, but you better know what you're doing, right? And so every spring we get beekeepers that just dump those bees in that box, have no earthly idea how to keep them alive, and it's kind of a miniature tragedy, you know. And, and for some people, it works out fine. They just have a real quick learning curve that they got to get on top of. And other people, you know, they just get frustrated and they get out. Um, the best way is to take a class, right? So we have our Iowa Honey Producer Association in Iowa. It's a real strong group of beekeepers. 
Uh, it's well over a thousand members, maybe 1300 or so. I'm not even sure exactly where the number is. Uh, it's grown a lot. You know, in the short time I've been here in Iowa, uh, you know, over that 13 years, you know, we had, I think, less than 500 members. <laughs> and so now we've got almost three times that. And that shows you the interest in beekeeping has exploded. So if you go to that iowahoneyproducers.org website, just as someone that's just even kind of interested in bees, what you'll find is resources, right? You'll see a link to all the local clubs because having a mentor, you know, having other beekeepers that are nearby you that are experiencing all this stuff in the same season as you are, that's invaluable, right? Especially when you're just trying to figure stuff out. And we do classes all over the state. And most of those classes are basically at cost. Some are even free. You know, you might have to pay eight bucks for the book. You know, it's that kind of a thing, but no extra charge for anything. And those classes usually start in January or so and go through, you know, maybe once a week for four to six weeks. And that way you're learning about this and you're making your decisions before the day the bees come, right? And those classes teach you all about keeping bees here in Iowa. What's different, you know, in Iowa than Florida or Canada or wherever else, you know, it's local, right? We have different winters. We have different seasonality to things. So there's just really no replacement for a local knowledge, education, mentorship, and you can find all that right there on that iowahoneyproducers.org website. That's a good starting place. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you mentioned <clears throat> buying equipment and things like that. So maybe you can, can you touch on some of the basic equipment? Again, I, I'm i just the grunt labor. Sure. Mrs. Sure. Dumbass here. Well, I see it all <laughs> out there. It's all looking good. Yeah, we're going to check into it later we're, on, we're but I have a feeling we're going to see some good stuff going honey on. Mrs. Dumbass's honey hive over here, right, later, <laughs> yeah. but... Uh, I'm literally the grunt labor, and that's good. I like that role because yeah. um, I don't know anything about bees. And, and it's a whole different language when she's talking to me about bees. So can you kind of put some framework around you know, equipment, just yeah. basic equipment needed for people that uh, want to do that? I know yeah. that's on the website, but let's talk. To well, them. yeah, no, let's get into details here. So the basic equipment that's uh, almost universally recommended to start with is just your typical Langstroth hive, right? And that's that the, just like you guys have. It's, it's a box. It's got about 10 frames in it, right? Those are like uh, files in a filing cabinet sort of. They just fit right in. And the bees draw out their combs on that. And so in the lower boxes, that's where the queen is and that's where she's going to be laying her eggs and rearing their brood and that's kind of like their home and above that the hives get taller and taller right one hive is one stack of boxes and th so through the season what you want is those bees to build up and above everything else like in their attic is where they store their food so a typical beehive hat in iowa is two of those 10 frame boxes for the life of the colony right that's kind of their nest and then above that's what we call honey supers and so that stack of boxes, maybe two boxes uh, for the for the hive, and then maybe another, say two or three more for the honey. That's going to be your typical setup, right? And so for a new beekeeper, you're going to need recommended two of those. Um, some people will just start with one, but if anything at all goes wrong, you're in trouble, right? Especially as you're trying to figure out what's good versus bad, what's normal versus abnormal. Um, a lot of times, if you have an issue in one hive, you can fix it by taking resources from that second hive. At the same time, two hives is a good recommendation rather than, say, five, because it's expensive enough to get into bees, and everything that goes wrong along the way costs you money, right? If you mess up and you kill a queen, there goes 45 bucks or so. If you don't get your boxes added on in time, as I said, you start low and then stack them higher as the season goes. If you're slow with that, the bees can you know feel overcrowded, and that's one thing that drives them to swarm, where... They just leave <laughs> half the colony with the queen leaves so that's a problem you know all these things are just part of the normal learning curve and so if you have two hives not that big of an investment a couple few hundred dollars a piece is what we're looking at um you can learn make those mistakes over the first year or so if you have success and your bees are coming through winter and you want to go bigger then it's really easy to take those resources you got live bees now to work with so you're not dependent on suppliers to, to sell you everything you need you can set up more hives have them ready to go in spring make splits from those existing hives where you're taking some of the strength of that colony putting it into a new box with a new queen and grow that way and that's kind of a, a pretty common recommendation is start with two and grow from there and learn the lessons as you go yeah oh, that makes sense yeah. yeah so then what do you do you just go if as you move those bees to another hive do you go out and purchase then another queen for that other hive is that what you do yeah commonly that's what and you know there's there's uh it you know different 
methods and things. You can make your own queen. You can start by just giving them eggs, right? Uh, eggs and young larvae from the existing queen. With no queen in there, the bees will recognize that and they can make their own queen. I'm a person that really just thinks, go ahead and spend the money on having a mated queen sold to you in a cage. And it's like a little matchbook size box with a queen in there and she's ready to go, right? And if you put that in there, to me, that's worth that investment because she can be released from that as soon as the bees kind of recognize that she's the only queen they have. Otherwise, they'd be aggressive to her. So you leave her in that cage a couple days, let her out. Now she can start laying eggs and that hive can take off right from there. You know, you can make your own queen, think, well, I'll save that 40, 45 bucks. But it takes a while, right? You got a couple weeks before that queen's out and then she's got to get mated. You know, you have to have your fingers crossed through this whole process. Make sure she doesn't get eaten by a bird or anything crazy like that. Come back unharmed, start laying eggs another three weeks before that first brood is emerging as an adult. So it takes a while, right? That's a couple months. So for me, that investment of a new queen is a good way to go. And yeah, you, you, yeah. you sold me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm greedy. I like to make as much honey from these bees as possible. And we make some good honey here in Iowa. You know, I started keeping bees, like I said, down in Kentucky. And I was pretty happy with the honey there, right? I don't want to slam Kentucky. I loved it there. Um, but did it, Iowa. Did it taste like bourbon? <laughs> yeah, it was why, darker, right? Like you know? <laughs> I don't know, bourbon or tobacco or something in there. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> yeah, but here, you know, we make a nice light clover honey. And, uh, you know, if you have honeys from around, there's there's some good honey, and it's different, right? Because the, the flavor of the honey, the color of it, the, the smell of it, everything is dependent on the flowers that you had available to those bees, which is kind of where you guys come in, right? Habitat, conservation, you know, taking care of your environment that you're in, having a little patch of land and doing what you can on it. You can't separate the bees that are back there from the land that they're on. I mean, it's 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 more than a little handshake deal. It's not like a a pig or something like that that just needs a spot and it's going to get its food thro thrown at it. It these bees are going out there and they're finding exactly what remains in the environment. So diversity, landscape, plenty of uh, flower uh, floral sources for them, water source, all that is just you so got to have it. Let's hang on to that just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me ask one more question on kind of the equipment and starting up the oh, hive, sure. and then we'll transition to the habitat piece because I think that's a great transition where you're going. Um, if I was going to start a hive, again, I got nothing. I want to start from scratch. Is there a certain time of year that you're either mandated to do it or kind of dictated to do it, or can you start any time of the seasons? Another good question there. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up for anybody who's thinking about bees. Springtime is a time, right? We're too late in the season now to start, get everything put together, get bees put in it, and have that little small, little tiny colony that you're starting with build up into something that has plenty of food stores and plenty of numbers of bees and, and strength behind it so that they can survive winter, you know? And that's the whole thing. Like the whole idea behind these big old colonies of honeybees with all these thousands and thousands of bees in them is it takes all those components of that hive to gather up enough resources, you know, honey, you know, all this kind of stuff so that they have food stores to make it through winter. They don't hibernate, you know, like a lot of animals. Their strategy as honeybees is to, um, you, you have that queen, one queen in there with all these thousands of worker bees all balled up and they're consuming the honey that they've stored up through the year through the warm parts of the year to endure the cold months when it's too cold to fly there's no plants for them out there so they have to have a lot of resources saved up you know it takes 80 90 pounds to get through an Iowa winter that's a lot of honey right that's for them beekeepers get everything in excess of that right some years we get plenty other years we don't some years we're feeding our bees other years those hives are so heavy with the honey stores of bees brought in they don't need a drop and it varies, right? And that's where beekeepers come in. You know, you got to be in, in tune to all of this and paying attention and taking care of those bees when nature doesn't provide. But yeah, so all of that to say, we start with hives typically in say April, mid-April is a common time to start. Usually we'll start with a three pound screen box of bees per hive, right? And inside that screen box with all these bees just literally funneled into it is one caged queen, just like I described earlier, and all these other worker bees we start those that time of year, everything fresh and new in that hive, and it takes them all season long, you know, to build up in strength, build up in number, draw that comb, store all that food, produce more bees, maybe some surplus honey for the beekeeper. We always hope that first year even, uh, and then be ready to go into winter. So you can't start them out too late. It's a spring thing. And that's why those classes are usually over winter time is, you know, learn what you need to do, make your decisions, find out where to buy these things, right? There's local producers wherever you are. Uh, and make those decisions and start come April or May. So he answered the one question that I was going to ask, you know, because we were 
as we were talking, you said, hey, this time of year is a little too late, and we're in the middle of July, you know, just as a time reference. Uh, um, how long does a queen live? I know the least about bees of anybody in this room, so I'm going to ask the dumb questions. No, no, this is all good, yeah. Uh, and I'm glad you're bringing these up. I, I'm talking to beekeepers all the time, so I might be making assumptions in my head. Let's start with some basics, right? So, and don't let me ramble on too well, long no, either here because you know, beekeepers, <laughs> we can do right that, man. Right <laughs> yeah, we can talk bees out of right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a problem, really. <laughs> I stopped having conversations about anything else about one year into beekeeping. The rest of everything goes by. So, so there's three types of bees in that hive, right? So we got one queen. I mentioned her a couple of times. She's like the mom of the colony. Uh, she's laying eggs, you know, she, whether she's a mother or a slave or if, if those two things are almost the same, I don't know, but she's in there. She lives in the darkness of that hive and it's her entire life to just lay an egg, turn around, find another spot, lay an egg, turn around, find another spot, lay an egg. And she does that over a thousand times every single day from earlier, well, from late winter, even before spring comes around up until, you know, state fair time here, you know, August, you know, mid August, early September, she's starting to kind of reduce the numbers. Winter's coming, right? Not as many flowers out. Days are getting a little bit shorter. They can sense that. And so she's going to taper off that egg laying. She'll still be laying something up until uh you know into december some years you know when things really start to get cold and, and and all that so anyway you know she's egg laying machine that's the queen there's typically just one in a co in a colony almost all of those eggs that she's laying are uh fertilized eggs they're going to be a female bee and the female bee that's not a queen right because she's also female obviously is called workers and so the mass of your hive is worker bees and the they call them worker bees because they work uh, when as soon as they emerge, their job is to basically just get themselves straightened out, you know, shake their head, dry off, and start eating so they can start to turn around and take care of brood, right? So all that developing, their younger sisters, they'll they'll be feeding them, keeping the hive clean, taking care of all sorts of in hive tasks. They hit a couple weeks old, that's when you see them start to maybe defend the entrance for a little while, that kind of thing, guard duty, and then they start flying foraging, and they'll spend the rest of their lives foraging. So that worker bee might live in this time of year, in midsummer, for maybe only five, maybe six weeks total because they're just wearing themselves out, right? They're flying miles and miles and miles and miles and miles, visiting all sorts of flowers, collecting all nectar, pollen, propolis, which is another resource. It's a plant resin they bring in, water. You know, they got a lot of duties and they just fly until their wings are tattered and shredded and they're old and worn out. They'll fly out and never return. That's kind of what happens to your worker bee. So they're very short lived. There's a third type of bee, the drone, that's the male bee. And the male bee doesn't do anything, doesn't even have a stinger to defend the hive. It's there for one purpose, and that's to go out every uh, you know mid morning or whatever, and uh, they'll leave the hive. And they have these kind of, wherever your hive is, they're what we call drone congregation areas in the environment. And it's usually a line of trees, you know, some clue, and the drones just know, okay, I live here, I'll go over there. And they just fly out of the hive maybe late morning and they just kind of buzz around high up in the air and they aren't doing anything except they're sensing what's around them. they're basically sniffing the air and they're sniffing the air for a virgin queen because the one time i said that queen lives in the hive and just lays eggs all the time of course the obvious exception is she does leave when when she's a brand new adult bee just a few days old she leaves and she goes out on that same flight and those drones find her and race each other to her and she's going to mate with maybe eight, 12, maybe 20 drones, and then they're gonna inseminate her. You know, you gotta do that if you're gonna be spending the rest of your life laying eggs. So once she's inseminated by, you know, this good handful of drones, she's back in the hive and that's where she's gonna spend the rest. So that's the one uh, function of the drone is just to hopefully mate with a queen, right? The majority of drones don't even get to do that. <laughs> but they try every day, right? <laughs> I, can, so, I can relate to that. Uh, I think we probably all can I think try all every can, day. Yeah. I think three or four of us can relate to and that. And some three more successful four. to others. I'm sure we can relate to that too. <laughs> a, honey, yeah. a honeybee colony is really the perfect Amazonistic society because those males do, they get kicked out in the winter and to die. And then they make more drones in the spring. Yeah. if one is needed so yeah. it even gets better then it not is, only do yeah, most of them not get a mate <laughs> but in the winter time they get kicked out freeze that, and die that right is their that's purpose right. is to mate with the queen and they get kicked out and die <laughs> yeah and so then you just, hope the queen's going to live for a couple of years just to finish that question there so you got all this different stuff going on but 
yeah, those, those poor drones, man, not only didn't they ever get the job done, they also end up just getting kind of hacked by their own sisters. But They, they, feel, so, <laughs> they feel so used. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a rough life, man, no matter who you are in there. I wonder what they're talking about while they're flying around sniffing, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Me or oh, you? Man. Me or you? <laughs> yeah, it's it's <laughs> rock. It's All right. Let's get- Iowa Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Kiyosakwa, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. (laughs) Let's get back to seriousness here. You touched on habitat. So, you know, I mean, this is probably something you need to consider even before you know, you want to have bees, right? So what should people understand about habitat if they want to have bees and and what's the best type of habitat? Sure. Yeah, man, these are good questions. So um, you just got to have those resources for them, right? So uh, bees can survive just about anywhere, right? There are beekeepers in New York City with them on rooftops. And and to me, that seems like about the most miserable environment for for anybody <laughs> living in the middle of all that. But, uh, you know, they can do it even there, you know, with as limited resources as they have. So you think about what Iowa can provide, especially if you're not in an area that's just corn and beans, right? When, you, when you're when big time cropped and all that you have is just miles of corn or beans around you, there's not a lot of diversity out there. And that's what bees need. So our biggest factor here in Iowa isn't the weather, the seasonality, whatever. It's finding those areas where there's flowers all through from spring through fall right so in some areas you're limited basically just your roadsides and ditches and things like this or along a waterway right with a tree line that goes along a creek or a river uh and and it's amazing how well even those areas as compromised as they are from a diversity kind of perspective can produce so when i get into areas like where we are now around bussy I, I just look around and think, man, there's pasture, there's, you know, there's all kinds, there's hills, there's valleys, it's not all planted. It, it's a great place for beekeeping, right? So if we think about what that is, you got a little bit of protection from all the pesticide spraying, you know, because that's part of living in Iowa too, right? As there's, We're in spray plane season. I saw several of them even just driving down here. If it kills, uh, you know, some insect growing on a corn or a soybean aphid or something like that, it's toxic to a honeybee, right? So we got to be careful with that. And we've got rules in place for all that kind of stuff too. And it works out pretty decently usually. There's a lot less, at least reported, bee kill events than what you would think of for having almost, what, 30 million acres in big monoculture type row cropping here in Iowa. Um, but that you, you got to have a little bit of a, of a buffer from ag lands, mostly for that pesticide, and then you just need diversity. So planting for bees, unless you got a lot of land, is a little bit tricky because you know they're going to fly for a couple mile radius right there's a lot of acres in a two mile three mile radius you know what is it like nineteen thousand acres in a two mile radius i think i might be messing that up but that's a lot right two miles in any direction so if you got 10 20 acres you can really do your best by providing them kind of a buffer zone from the sprays, from the things like that. Give them a little habitat so they don't have to work so hard in their immediate area. And then know they're gonna exploit all those resources, all those flowers, that water source, things like that on your property. But they're also gonna be flying further. So you gotta look, maybe get on that Google image, you know, and and zoom out on that satellite map and just kind of look what's around and consider all of that. Because even for people that don't own their own land, as long as their bees are near some good stuff, you know, that, that bee doesn't care about a fence line at all. So, Andy, you've brought this up a couple times around water. Mm-hmm. And uh, is it important to have a water supply or water source wherever you have your hives? Well, it is, and it's also not that big of a concern around here because, you know, wherever you are around here, there's usually some water pulled up or a pond, a lake, a stream, something like that, right? We have had droughts, and it was looking like we were going into one a couple of few weeks ago to where the bees are spending more energy getting water than nectar. But I don't mean to overemphasize a water source versus, you know, okay. floral diversity or something that's out there in the environment. But it is important, right? So if beekeepers that are in town, which is kind of probably a little bit aside from who your main listeners are, I would guess, beekeepers that live on small property, maybe inside a city, something like that, you know, they might want to provide a water source directly for their bees. It could be a kiddie pool with a bunch of rocks in it, or even a chicken waterer sort of setup, as long as they keep that thing full every day. 
because those bees are collecting a lot they're using that to cool down their hive air condition things you know they, they use a lot of water um and if you're in town you know the worst thing the, the worst enemy of a beekeeper is, is uh, the neighbor's swimming pool not the neighbor but the neighbor's pool right because that can create issues so your bees going over there that nice blue water it even has a little chlorine bees love that chlorine salt and they go over there and line the edge of the pool collect that and that creates neighbor issues or maybe a dog's water bowl you know for you know pets or, or uh, something like that that's outdoors so providing a water source in town is probably a bigger issue than than it is out in the country because the bees will find them you know they, they don't mind flying a little distance to collect things yeah. If if one was gonna create some habitat around your hives, um, you know, what would you recommend here in Iowa? Well, this is kind of focus here in Iowa for right now. So sure, sure. Clovers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What other? I think one of the big things that makes uh, Iowa honey so good is is our our different clovers that we have, right? So we start out with that white Dutch clover, the the real little clover, you know, that grows, and you got to have enough water on throughout the season, or else it gets burned out and stops producing pretty early in the year. Uh, I'm seeing it come back in right now. Um, that used to be in grass seed mixes, you know, and then we got kind of obsessed with this perfect green lawn and did away with all the clover that was in there. But we have alcite clover. There's a number of different varieties that you can buy clover seed for and plant on your own. We've got yellow and white sweet clover, you know, the bigger kind of gangly looking taller plants. I see a lot of pollen coming into my hives on yellow. It, in my experience here in Iowa, I, I don't think I've ever got a big honey crop off of yellow sweet clover. Uh, but the Dakotas always talk about making massive crops off of that. I, I think for us, maybe we just don't have the temperatures, you know, things like that's a little earlier, but yellow to me kind of signals white sweet clover is about to come on. And I think that white sweet clover is a big one. Um, I think we get a lot of pollen and nectar. Of course, nectar is what becomes honey. So that's what at least I obsess about as a beekeeper. Uh, we got birds put trefoil, which is the legume and improves the soil. You see it along the ditches, you know. I don't know how many people plant that stuff, but I mean, that's a good one, a good weed for beekeepers. Um, but yeah, if you put in a clover patch, uh, and it's kind of a, a biannual, right? You kind of got to keep up with it. It's not just a set it and forget it sort of deal. But, you know, in, in theory, you can just let that stuff kind of take over. It's kind of invasive uh, within the within its own boundaries. And that's a good food source for bees. That's a real good one. Other things might be alfalfa, things like that. We have people that farm, you know, plain alfalfa, but oftentimes it gets cut off before it really starts producing for the bees. So there are some issues there with that. You got to let that go a little longer than, than what people like to do for it to really provide a lot of nectar for bees. But again, that can be a great one. I'm seeing some sunflowers in, uh, coming into different places. Those are awesome for all sorts of wildlife, right? Um, what else uh northwest iowa we're starting to see some canola coming in up there that's a huge honey plant up north like into canada that's a big one drives them that's really good clear uh real light colored honey um the list goes on but for landowners around here providing habitat there's you know our crp mixes right there's a special mix of of a pollinator mix for crp there's a couple different varieties of it that can be kind of tuned into your area, how much water you got, lowlands, highlands, whatever, drainage kind of things. You can tune the, that seed mix in, and it's a mix of grasses and forbs, and those forbs in there can provide some great uh, nutrition for your beehives. Yeah, so we've got about seven acres of uh, CP42 on ours. Um, I want to go back to the clovers, you know, as we have a lot of hunters on ours. Like uh, Ladino clover is another. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Is a is another good one. You know that the deer like and also can be dual purpose, right? Yeah. Yep. You know some when we get into like the uh, the the red clover, uh, I see a lot of of uh, bumblebees on that. Um, I see a lot of butterflies on that kind of stuff. I don't see a lot of honeybees. So you kind of have to maybe look up the types of clover that you're going to provide. All clover seems to provide a lot of pollen and a lot of nectar. But there's something about the the flower shape to that. Uh, I think some of those, in particular, like the red clovers, it's so deep throated that that bee has to have a, a real long tongue to get down in there. And so uh, your typical honeybee just doesn't have the physiology to to reach down that straw to get to the to the nectar that's in there. So there are some issues there. But I mean, clover in general, I, I feel is really good. I know some of the hardcore prairie enthusiasts think clover's a little invasive and if you're planting a mix and you're trying to get your natives to come up it can take over and i totally get that kind of stuff um but 
you know, we like weeds, beekeepers. We like those invasive weeds where there's just a carpet of, of a particular flower and it's just like, go over there. You know, that's a whole field of the same thing. Do that's what we like. Spray your dandelions. <laughs> that's right. Dandelions are huge. That. Yeah, that's right. We like weeds. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, beans and corn. Yeah. So will honeybees, you know, pollinate, get the pollen from from uh, beans and corn? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we're seeing some corn pollen coming in, uh, you know, this season, especially a couple weeks ago with some sweet clo or sweet corn pollen coming in. I don't think it's the greatest pollen in the world. I think sometimes when we see a whole bunch of corn pollen coming in, you can tell by the color it is and, you know, just kind of the association. We know corn's, you know, tasseling and all that. Um, it, I don't think that's the best pollen. You know, that's a wind-pollinated plant, you know. And so usually wind-pollinated uh, um, types of pollen – uh, are, are a little less nutritious for the bees than the ones that are really begging the bees to come to them, right? Um, so I think corn pollen ain't anything too great, but it's something for them, you know. So it, corn doesn't provide any nectar, you know, because again, it's not trying to attract a pollinator to get to it. It's just blowing around in the wind, right? So that's not ideal. When I, you know, corn's fine. Corn's good for Iowa. Corn's good for, you know, deer, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but not really a bee, bee's best friend. But it doesn't hurt them. I mean, no. I've, it, I've I mean, heard, I've heard um, folk, folklore around. Hey, if your bees go and get pollen from corn or beans, it'll they'll bring it back to hive, and that kills them. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a pesticide element to all of this kind of stuff, right? Okay. You don't want to attract your bees into these fields and then have them, you know get exposed to whatever whether it's a boom or a plane or something that's in the plant you know coming up even from the seed when it's first planted so there is an issue there i, I don't know in the real world that i'd be too afraid of any of that kind of you know corn seed treatment kind of stuff coming up through the plant systemic they're getting it a little tiny dose of it i, I think as long as you're in a decent enough area with good diversity out there you know, uh, I mean, that's an old saying, dilution is the solution to pollution, right? So even if there is a little problem going on, as long as your bees have other things that they're getting to, then it's just a little bit in the in the big picture. Um, maybe that's not the best way to look at it, but I think that's a real kind of real world practical way. Now, beans are a different example, right? I'm, I'm looking at this extended forecast and uh, I'm just begging for it to just be a little warmer than what it's even going to be, right? This next week around here, 10 days at least on my phone, looks like it's going to be nice and sunny. We've had a little of this rain here, rain there. It's going to dry out. And I'd just love to see that temperature creep over that 90 degree line because our beans are flowering. And that can be a pretty significant uh, boost to your, to your overall honey crop coming from beans. And soybean honey sounds kind of disgusting. You know, to my ear, it's just, who wants to eat bean honey? But it's good. It's light colored honey and it's floral and it's it's sweet and uh, there isn't anything wrong with it at all. So I love the idea that, you know, we're we're heading in right as everything's blooming. We got big hives of bees. Um, those bean fields are just really full of flowers. You don't see them when you drive by. But if you go through there and just kind of kick up the leaves, they got a lot of flowers in there. And uh, it takes a lot of heat, it takes dry and hot before they really start yielding. But that can be good for pollen and nectar for bees. Um, likewise, the bean growers, uh, in some parts of the, the, you know, we're all using different varieties of beans and we all have a different season, but there've been studies going back years that have showed that they can get a little bit of a crop yield from having bees come in, right? Those beans can take care of themselves. They're what's called self-fertile, right? Most of these varieties of them are, so they aren't dependent on a bee to visit them, uh, to, to make a crop, but it has been shown that it does significantly help your yield if you have bees nearby and they're coming over in your fields. The big thing with soybeans and soybean aphids is we don't want to have our bees going into those bean fields and then have that yellow plane come over and spray them right out of the air. That's the big question mark there. And of course that can happen. Here in Iowa, we have a bee rule in pesticides that says that if you voluntarily as a beekeeper, no one's forcing you to do this, but you can voluntarily put your site location onto a map and then that map automatically draws a two or a one mile radius around your hive and the pesticide, any commercial pesticide applicators require to view that satellite map and see if there's any beekeepers with bees, uh, in the area that they're going to be spraying. And if there is any overlap there of where they're spraying something that's been labeled as toxic to bees within that one mile radius of where that beekeepers dot on the map is, they have to do that application before 8am or after 6pm. And that really does do a lot. It's not perfect, 
but does a lot to kind of avoid that overlap of people like me that are like, all right, looks like good forecast for some bean honey. Bees are in there and then get sprayed out. It, it really goes a long way to help that out. That's pretty oh, yeah. smart, yeah, that's isn't it? That's I smart. I think that yeah. uh, site is Field Watch. Yeah. Field Watch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's smart. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that edge, you know, in, in so many ways, you know, honeysuckle is always kind of on the edge of a wooded area and a field, you know, that edge is important, right? For no matter what we're talking about uh, out there, um, there's a lot of wildlife. There's a lot of stuff that goes on right on that edge of a woodland in, in, a, in a pasture or whatever. And that honeysuckle is right there and it smells, you know, you can smell that sweet, that fragrance of it. You can see those flowers and that's like a magnet to bees, you know, of all sorts, you know, all, all kinds of wildlife is just almost drawn to that. And honeybees are right in there, you know, in the thick of that, when that stuff's good and sticky, there'll be bees all over it. So it provides, right. You mentioned dandelions in, in, you know, our mode areas. Those are good early resources, uh, honeysuckle, uh, maybe some locust trees. That's relatively early bloom, provides a lot of nectar in some years. Um, all the different clovers, the trefoil, linden trees or basswood. That's another one you see. Um, that's a big one, you know, that just goes on. So the idea is that honeysuckle, no one's making honeysuckle honey, but it just is more that goes into the pool, right? That the bees are storing up early season when honeysuckle is that honey that they bring in that nectar might not ever end up in a honey super but that's going to be food and fuel for that colony as they're spiraling up their workforce right so that's going to stimulate that queen keep on laying eggs keep on building up that colony and that's the thing right so it's kind of missing the point of beekeeping just to say plant a field of clover and now you got good habitat for your bees because you need stuff from you know march all the way through you know september ending with golden rods uh, different species of those, asters, you know, things like this is our late season. You just always want blooms. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. All I'm thinking about is all these invasive species. Yeah, Multi that's right. <laughs> Multiflora rose, yeah. thinking autumn olive. I'm thinking about all this stuff that, you know, we're trying to eradicate. That's right. Yeah. So, well, and that's a good point to bring up, right? And I don't know if I'm the best, you know, biologist type person to really answer those, but there is kind of a competing thought, right? We want, as beekeepers, we want honey crops, and that's a lot of invasives, right? Because it's just a carpet of flowers, all the same thing. The bees can target it really easily come back in a very short time with a big yield, right? And then we can take that yield off. That's our honey. But big picture, you just got rid of everything else that would have been blooming there, right? You just got rid of the diversity in the area yeah. to hit that one target, and that might be foolish too. So, um, I mean, that that is kind of the issue, right? Yeah, other places are talking about, you know, purple loose strife. You know, that's a big controversial thing or... Um, Gosh, there's one uh, is TT or something down there in like the Florida, the Everglades, or they're, they're, they have different honey plants down in these other areas of the country than what we do. And there's always somebody that's gung ho to try and eradicate this invasive, obnoxious type, uh, noxious, I called it obnoxious type weed. And then the beekeepers are just like, oh, you're taking our honey away from us, right? So there's always that controversy there. But I mean, these are real world things. You know, the more we change the land, the more we use the land, things we got to pay attention to because there is a big picture to it. Yeah. yeah, what I took away from that is is our audience go back to season one on Living on the Edge episode because uh, what I heard you say, Andy, was not only does Living on the Edge for habitat for animals, but uh, it's a big deal for uh, honeybees also. So That's that right. might be an episode to go back and check out. Okay, any questions, Tim, on anything so far? Nope, not yet. Okay. okay. Um, let's kind of close out here and talk about you know, risk and downside and, you know, horror stories that can happen to, you know, to be keepers. Um, you keep hearing, I keep hearing about, you know, people going out and their hives are completely gone or dead or, you know, what's that all about? Sure. Uh, you know, there is a lot of stuff that can go wrong, right? It, it's harder now uh, than what it probably ever has been in history to start that beehive keep it in good shape, keep it alive through a winter, it's still there for you to do the same thing next year. You know, it's challenging. There's a lot to learn, right? Um, it's also kind of part of what's interesting about beekeeping. You know, if once upon a time you could just have a hive of bees and you put it out there and you just let them rip 
and then you came out later in the season, took their honey away from, said, see in springtime, right? If that ever existed, it isn't like that now. <laughs> they, they need regular checks, right? There's an element of being a beekeeper that exists now, necessarily that exists, that didn't used to be the case. So um, things that can go wrong uh, are, you know, pesticides are, of course, an issue. We just talked about that. But a lot of it's within the hive, right? Our queen quality. We don't know if we're getting quality enough queens uh, bred and mated for us. You know, something just seems different. You ask how long queen lived. 20 years ago, I probably would have said, you know, pushing three years, two, three years. Now I just kind of almost mumbled my way through that and said, ah, a year, maybe two, right? So that's a pretty good indication that things are different now. A lot of it is this varroa mite that we get. And if you've got bees, you've got varroa mites. In my head, that's almost just like a one-to-one -one equation. And, and a lot of us are in denial about that. And I think the biggest hurdle uh, to becoming a more successful beekeeper is almost just getting your butt kicked by that varroa mite one time. Learn your lesson that they're going to get you <laughs> before you even might ever see one in your hive, right? Because they're small. They're about the size of a pinhead. And they reproduce down in your bee brood. It's under capping, right? So as that bee is pupating and sealed up from the rest of the environment, that mite goes down in there right before that gets sealed over. And that mom starts laying eggs, about one per day. First a male and then females. And she's just going to keep on doing that during the length of time that that little bee is pupating in that cell before she ever chews her way out as an adult. So all this is completely concealed from even the beekeeper that's putting their head in the hive. It's beneath the pupil capping, right? So the idea is one mite goes into that cell and a week and a half or so later, out comes mom and as many of her offspring as, as can survive outside of the womb of that cell, which is a couple, right? It's not a bunch, it's a couple. Most of them don't reach a maturity level where they can survive outside of it. But you get this doubling and redoubling of this mite population through the season. And we have to be careful about the way that we take care of these mites because we're trying to produce a food product, right? So we can't come in with these big, talking about pesticides, we can't come in with stuff that we would be afraid of contaminating the honey for human consumption. We're trying to kill a mite, kind of like a little tiny arachnid on an insect. So closely related things, probably if something's going to be toxic to the mite, it'll also be toxic to the bees. So we have that concern with whatever we treat for mite might hurt our bees if we're not careful with it. And then we have the concern of residues and contamination of honey. So that really limits us, A, in what we can use for this mite, and B, when we can use these treatments, which are limited usually for most products to the times where we don't have those supers, those boxes for, for honey for, for us to take off for humans. So, you know, springtime and then late season. And uh, that makes it really hard. You know, this majority of the year is out of touch for a treatment. Meanwhile, this thing's just multiplying and multiplying in there. These mites do physical damage to the bees, and they also carry a bunch of viruses. It's like a tick. A tick gets on you, who cares? Pull it off. But that tick might have Lyme disease, might have this or that, and the mite is kind of the same thing. So that's our biggest enemy, right? And to treat that little mite is the biggest challenge for a new beekeeper, to get that figured out and really dialed in. It's the biggest challenge for any beekeeper, really. So we've got this and that going on. But if we can manage uh, nutrition, in a beehive with a good environment and some supplemental feeding when it's necessary and we can get that mite control underway and we have an idea of what brood should look like you know by being a beekeeper what things should look like in there versus what they're not then we're doing light years uh you know above a more neglectful or inexperienced beekeeper might be doing right so it's all about learning and never quit learning because these things change right you're trying to manage these things and it's a moving target and uh and staying on it so there's again it just comes to that be a good beekeeper learn as much as you can and be super diligent and take care of your hives and you'll be all right as challenging as it is and it's rewarding as it ever was so as you talk yeah. about these these parasites these these mites in this this example is it possible to completely eradicate them or is it just a process of managing Right now, it's process of managing it, right? So again, you know, kind of like the diversity thing, there's kind of a big picture and a little picture. As much as we come in and control these mites, you know, come in and, and kill them as many as we can, you're never going to get them all. So there's always going to be something, you know, all we're doing is really just tamping them down, tamping them down. But, you know, if you look at that big picture, all we're doing is just delaying things. We're on a treadmill, right? So the things that we use uh, to kill them now, they might become resistant to. And we've had a history of that is the first things that we use for mites, you know, back in the 90s were going out of style when I started keeping bees tw about tw almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago or something. You know, I was right around the time that um, 
there was this product called Checkmite that was in heavy use, and it was replacing one called Apistan. That Checkmite strip, you know, people were not using it with honey supers on, again, for the risk, but that's a product called Kumafos, and that's a, a organophosphate. That's a neurotoxin. In the uh, They call it the LD50. The lethal dose for 50% of the population was one of those strips, and we were putting four of those strips into a beehive back then. <laughs> so, I mean, these things are toxic, right? Uh, and that stuff has lingered on through years and through time. The funny thing is as toxic as that mite strip was to people, a varroa mite nowadays could crawl around on that thing and be more or less unaffected. At least most varroa mites could because resistance has grown to it, right? From using it time and time again, what you're doing is you're selecting for a population that can deal with it, right? You're killing off everything that's susceptible to it. And now you've got mites where it doesn't do anything. And so you got this, again, this moving target. So you just gotta, gotta stay on. I think I kind of wandered my, my way off into a tangent with that, but we're also getting smarter with this chemistry too, right? You know, some of the things I've personally used this year, one thing was formic acid, right? There's a new product, it's a little bit in the weeds, but it's called Formic Pro. It's a measured amount of formic acid and that formic acid occurs naturally in honey. Uh, and it's, it's never gonna reach a level which would be in any way toxic to people. Um, so, I mean, talk about smarter, right? Uh, Timol is another one. I've used buckets of a uh, product that has Timol as an active ingredient. It's called Apigard. And it's in a gel so it doesn't flash and evaporate real quick, kind of tamps it down so a moderate amount's released every day. And that has worked really well. And Timol, you know, that's a, you know, it's a derivative of thyme plants. So, um, again, it's a pesticide, right? We want to follow the label. We want to use these things properly. But uh, much smarter, much safer. There's another product, oxalic acid. That's uh, the amount, or that's the kind of the, the, the thing that uh, occurs most in spinach and rhubarb, mm -hmm. kale, things like this, right? So the amount of oxalic acid that we can use in a beehive to kill mites uh, is about equivalent to the amount that's in like one of those big old bags, like those big old pillows that you buy of like fresh washed spinach leaves, you know, go down to Hy-Vee, buy that bag of spinach. That's about the same amount of oxalic as what we're putting in a beehive. But oxalic doesn't work very well if you got a lot of brood in there. So again, it's a timing thing. So we have all of these tools now, and we're getting smarter with and safer with our chemistries, and we've really made leaps and bounds that way. But at the same time, I think this mite has grown resistant to a lot of stuff that we've used, and these viruses have built up to a bigger issue than what they were in the past. So it's an arms race, right? Just like so many other things that you're trying to do. But I, I do feel like we're getting an edge. I don't know if we're ever going to get there to where they're just eradicated. Maybe there's some technology, who knows what the future brings, but we're not there yet. Genetics are a part of it. How about from a, from a virus's perspective, is it possible to eradicate like a virus from from the bee population? The biggest thing to control in that virus is to control its host, right? So, you know, just like Lyme disease, I, I think that's a pretty good thing. It's like, if you worry less about dealing with the Lyme disease itself and worry more about keeping ticks off of you, then you're probably better off. So the a beekeeper's practical way, we don't have any antiviral stuff, you know, at the ready, but if we know the mites are the source, they're the thing that's spreading or vectoring, I guess would be the right word, these viruses, if we keep the mites out of our hives, then we don't have the viral issues as much either. So it's that kind of a thing right now. Makes sense. So in, in these things, basically, I feel like we're spinning our wheels a little bit. We're buying ourselves time because again, that's a short term solution, right? To a big problem. We got too many mites, kill them, but then they come back, got to kill them again. Maybe breed a better bee that can deal with them on its own. That's a challenging thing, right? But if we could breed bees that weren't so susceptible to the mites, then we wouldn't have to worry about treatments as often. Or if we could do something to damage these mites or keep them from reproducing or something like that on a more scientific kind of heady level, something like that would be a longer term solution, right? Get rid of those mites so that we don't have to come in and monitor them and treat them and all this kind of stuff as beekeepers. So it'd be great if you could get create like a pheromone that would be toxic, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what the future brings, right? Who knows? Right now we're just kind of, we're in the thick of it right now, but you know, maybe in 10 years or five years or who knows what'll be around. Maybe they won't be so much an issue. Okay. It sounds Thank like you. a million dollar idea if you no could kidding. figure it out. Right? <laughs> That's so, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, any uh, any final questions for Andy here? No, this has been super interesting. I yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Andy, is there anything that we missed that uh, you know we should cover? I I don't have anything in my head. I guess I didn't really come with an agenda, but I appreciate the interest, right? And again, you know, uh, you'll have my contact information. 
uh, the honey producers, you know, come see us down at the fair. I don't know how fast you kick these episodes out. I'm wearing my fair t-shirt coincidentally right now. Spent a lot of time down there. Anybody that's interested and wants to look at bees, talk bees, that's a good, if they're in Iowa, and come down, and most states have state fair, and there's usually bees somewhere on there too, but I'm proud of what we do at the Iowa State Fair. Um, we have a good showing. Again, honey producers are behind it. We got a sales booth, lemonade, this and that. But there's beekeepers down there, and they're all like me. They all want to talk bees. They're all excited about it. We've got observation hives, you know, actual bees behind glass that you can safely see. We let them fly at the fairgrounds. They're flying over people's heads. You just don't know it. Um, we've got all sorts of things on display from honey to beeswax products, educational things to you name it. So anybody that is curious about bees, that's a great opportunity is see us at the fair mid August. Awesome. Yeah, and great. again, yeah. Andy, why don't you share your, uh, information, how people could get a hold of you? Sure. So I gave out my number is 515-326-5765. You can call or text that as my work cell. And my email is andrew.joseph at iowaagriculture.gov. Awesome. Yeah. So, Mrs. Dumbass, any questions? Oh, I always have a lot of questions, but uh, let's go open some hives. Okay. Awesome. Well, with that, let's close, close out up. the episode. So, right. with that, folks, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and get, get outdoors. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.